Welcome. Welcome to the Desert Laboratory. I'm Ben Wilder, and this is Richard Pelt. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is a, a very special night, and it's a, a great honor for me to be able to invite Richard here to the Desert Laboratory for, for many reasons. Um, maybe the, the first is, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for working with Richard. Um, he really opened the botanical and scientific world to me. And traveling, exploring, asking questions, and going through the islands of the Gulf of California um, was just a gift of a lifetime to be able to learn from him. And uh, well, it's just it's fun to have him come full circle here. <clears throat> During that time, many great things came to fruition. Doorstops such as this. <laughs> Which I'm very proud to say, now Richard's latest achievement is the vastly revised Flora of Nakapuli Canyon. Which is published, came out today as the very first proceedings of the Desert Laboratory. This is a new online open access journal that I started here at the Desert Laboratory, and uh, this beauty is, is launching us, so, anyway. <laughs> Great collaboration be between Richard, Sue Carnahan, and Jesus Sanchez at the Universidad de Sonora Herbarium, and so it's freely available on our website, and then you'll be able to order on-demand copies as well for your own library. So, but tonight we're going to get away from all that academic stuff. And I'm not sure how many of you have had the fortune to hear a Richard story. <laughs> they usually start with an offhand comment that just kind of leaves you wondering more. So, for example, I was a marine biologist before I became a botanist at the age of seven. <laughs> and then you, you ask, tell me more, and then the converse of the topic changes quickly, and you're just kind of What's going on here? I need to know more. And what you forget about, you think it's just kind of some hyperbole of some sort. You go on and then you hear the same little detail from a totally different person, different source. And not only was it true, but the story is far greater and grander than you could ever have imagined. You couldn't even make this stuff up. <laughs> and, and I think what's going to be really fun tonight is Richard's going to crack the door open a little bit more onto some of these some of these stories and let us in on, on and some of these grand tales and, and tales in the truest sense of the word of just wonderful adventures and explorations and well I just can't wait so Richard thank you welcome I had, a, I had an idea maybe we should just not have a reading just have a party <laughs> everybody who matters Everybody who counts is here, and thank you all, and thank you for inviting me. And I have a little spiel about Tumamak Hill, but uh, since we don't have four nights and four days, and you know we're all sort of like my plant specimens and pressed for time. <laughs> but it's really heartwarming to see Ben, now the Hefe of on Guajo Hill, uh, Horn Lizard Hill. That's the name, that's what Tumamoc means. And how many of you have seen Tumamoca? Tumamoca MacDougalli, named for, yeah. And uh, it, come, it makes a little vine and it comes out in the summer with the rains and botanists. <laughs> and, uh, I can't even start with the names of all the greats who preceded us and on whose shoulders we stand here in Tillamook Hill. I usually don't admit this, but the first time I was here was 60 years ago. Wow. Yeah. Before you were a marine biologist. <laughs> um, and Ben was wrong. I didn't get into botany until I was eight. <laughs> and this is where Forrest Shreve gave us the very concept of the Sonoran Desert. And Paul Martin, who I went to Madagascar with, who <coughs> was a mentor, and Ray Turner, and just too many others, so we won't even begin. But thank you for inviting me. 
So, Betsy, thank you. I guess I have to be less modest. That's Verbicina felgeri. <laughs> And we discovered it in Nakapuli Canyon. <laughs> and if anybody can't hear, just, you know, I usually have a loud mouth. So this is biomass balance. I'll put my glasses on, I can see. Biomass balance. We displace the animals. This planet of billowing billions, balancing all the animals gone. Whales and sea turtles took a lot of the slack. Warning to politicians, species yet to evolve will not remember your name. Pupfish and polar bears will not vote for you. Old pelicans come home at dusk and unionize bats fly out to skin little fish off the top of the sea. Whales call. Yellow mustards tumble in the dry air. It's time to drink cactus wine and streak red the soil for rain. Come sit oily on the beach. Come sort your bones in the marble museum. And I guess that was sort of after I left the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. <laughs> so just to tell you what's in store, uh, I think we only have until, what, 11 o'clock tonight? <laughs> uh, I'm going to do one short one, and then walking out, and then I'll do survival service in Ashgabat, and then plant power. That's three. I have others, but I don't think we'll have time. Can everyone hear? Yeah. You all got your hearing aids on? <laughs> Walking out. The mules had just been hobbled, and I was tightening the straps on the plant press. Thinking about the day's discoveries, I found a colony of white flowered Andantoglossum an astounding northern record. I managed to catch an iridescent green orchid bee pollinator. We were on the Chihuahua border in the Sierra Madre Occidental, beyond the end of the road at Don Nacho's Rancherito, and stumbled onto poppy fields. We were about to have late afternoon coffee when a couple of the gun-toting locals rode up and slithered off their saddles. Don Nacho gave them coffee. Turning to old Nacho quietly, they said, you can go, but we're not going to permit the senor to leave. That means they're going to kill you. We offered more coffee, which <laughs> sitting on their haunches around the smoldering fire. I was never very good at it, but managed macho stoicism sitting on my haunches too. They went off as it got dark, reminding Don Nacho about returning later. The situation seemed unreal. Don Nacho let the fire go down. I tried to talk to the old man but he wasn't in a talking mood. And besides, his Spanish wasn't that good, mine wasn't either. <laughs> and I only knew a few words in Warahio. He was so steady, it almost calmed me. It was soon so dark that I dared not move and sat up against the hard, scratchy trunk of a giant leaf tropical oak. Tough leaves so large you can use the water in upturned leaves to wash your face in the morning. Howard Scott Gentry said those leaves were handy in a dry camp. Don Nacho touched my shoulder and put his old dry hand over my mouth. 
before I could say a word. He got me up and led me to the pine forest just beyond our camp. I could barely make out his crooked finger urging me on. Even before I could ask, he covered my mouth with his scratchy hand. He was taking us somewhere. I wanted to get my jacket. It was pitch dark and I kept stumbling. He took us up the mountain, almost straight up and over the rocks, and then down through a canyon where earlier in the day I had found red-leaved bromeliads and yellow-flowered orchids clinging to north-facing shaded canyons. And back up over another steep slope. We worked around the gobby colonies that bloodied my legs. On the narrow animal path he was using for a trail, I started to fall, but he pulled me hillside, away from the abyss. Heavy darkness continued for hours, when mercifully the moon, raised, the moon rose, and I realized the poppy fields were on the other side of the mountain. I thought we might be going for help, some safe place. Tiny orange kerosene lights flickered far below, and again he took us higher and away from the valley bottom, echoing dog barks. We went hour after hour away from Ranchitos. I was getting cold, even though part of me was drenched in sweat. There were jackets, canteens, blankets, flashlights, and food at our camp, the two burrows, and my specimens. My camera, too. Still, he would not talk, or better, I would say, or let me talk. Don Nacho was not stopping. He did not step on anything that made a noise. I tried to copy him. Although the quarter moon gave some light, I had a hard time finding a good place to put my foot at almost every step. In the worst places, he took hold of my belt and led me like a stubborn mule. <laughs> it must have been midnight when I stopped to turn for a piss and felt my legs, feet, and whole body quivering as I tried to catch up and rest. He wouldn't even give me five seconds after I finished. I plodded on after him. We went so silently. <clears throat> that I could hear every night noise of poor wheels calling, bats squeaking, and once in a while, a cowbell far below. We went way around well-known, well-worn paths. A stream crossing, we slowed only to drink. A carpet of big, dry, crackly sycamore leaves nested among water-worn granite boulders in the, medic in the medicinal aroma of seep willow mixed with cattle smells on the damp canyon soil. Coming around a huge rock, there was a large animal growl. My feet were numb and my mind open to the sky. I almost forgot about being hungry. We walked in the black and white night world until the east sky slowly glowed warm with bird calls. More steep, crumbly slopes, and hours later, down to a valley bottom. We came around the backside of the village, adobe brick walls and palm thatch roof. The house opened to the warm south, beneath great, quiet Sabino trees along the now dry riverbed. We sat on homemade chairs balanced on hard-packed dirt floor, the seats and backs of interlaced rawhide strips with the fur still on. Doña Marina brought coffee and fresh warm t t tortillas wrapped in a cloth, dark beans and eggs. I slept like never before or since. <laughs> now I have to tell you that I think it was 30 years before that that Howard Scott Gentry told me he had the same thing happen. <laughs> Poppy fields. And I don't think those guys were very happy because about a month later after I was there, I heard that the Federalists raided them. And that's not far from where Paul Martin and the students had a horrific run-in 
that maybe those same guys are their kids. And that's not too far from Wiracoba. They say if you go to Wiracoba, bring your gun. If you're going to choke in Kawi, bring your coffin. But there's great plants there. <laughs> that's also where there's a canyon with magnolia trees. Ninety feet tall. Okay. This is a little different. By the way, it wasn't always like that, you know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Survival service in Ashgabat. 14th session, the General Assembly of IUCN and the 14th IUCN Technical Meeting Survival Service Commission, Ashgabat, USSR, 26 September to 5 October 1978. I've changed some names, by the way. Arrived early in Moscow. At customs, I was behind an exchange library. Her suitcase was full of her new book. Customs inspector turned every page. I tried to change lanes. Neat. They finished after midnight and did not even open my suitcase. We found a taxi to the Rosia on Red Square, the biggest hotel in the world. Next morning, sightseeing with IUCN friends. Red Square, babushkas sweeping cobblestone with short handle brooms of bundled sticks. Wide avenues and sparse traffic, remember 1978. Black Zill limousines zoom by, no siren, no stopping. <clears throat> you know to get out of the way. A car screeches to a halt in front of us. Two guys jump out, ask if we have pot for sale. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. The Keystone cops run back and zoom off. <laughs> We're deciding about dinner when a tall African wildlife expert asked us to wait for her. She was selling Levi's to a man in Red Square. Someone said he could be KGB. Oh no, I asked. And he said he wasn't a policeman. <laughs> she returned with a thick wad of U.S. hundred-dollar bills. Sharmateyev Airport. Up at 4 a.m., or that is, arrive at 4 a.m. for a 9 a.m. flight to Ashgabat. Have to be four hours early. Flight delayed. Can you tell us when? Yet. <laughs> Our hotel, I'm sorry, well maybe it's okay to leave out the page. <laughs> you wouldn't know. <laughs> we were in the VIP waiting room. By afternoon, the only place selling food was closed. I'd been forewarned. My suitcase was full of snacks for <laughs> sharing. We spent the night. The meetings are in four languages and multitudes of translated copies are needed, pronto. The delay had to be, the, the delay had to do with copy machines, airlifted from IUCN headquarters in Switzerland. <laughs> Our prohibited copy machines threatened the government. It was a few years before faxes helped bring down the empire. I went out for fresh air. It's nighttime. Russian soldiers yanked me aside. Someone grabbed my passport. Amerikansky! <laughs> Guns stacked like corn stalks. They pulled out vodka bottles from snow flecked great gray coats. Amerikansky, drink! <laughs> they were singing around a bonfire. 
I stumbled back to the terminal in a blur. <laughs> Next morning, we boarded Aeroflot with the coffee machines <laughs> for Ashgabat, 1,500 miles away. Someone said Aeroflot due to crashes. <laughs> Stella and I were more than friends. That evening, I headed for her room. Babushka stopped me. Niet. <laughs> Single men and women were assigned different wings. After I returned reluctantly to my room alone, Stella knocked on the door. How did you get past Brunhilde? We women have our way. Ashgabat is Persian for city of love. The hotel and meeting hall were built for our meeting. Workmen were still pounding nails. The Lenin statue had just been installed. High walls surrounded a rumored gulag across the street. Our hotel was designed in Moscow. All the rooms on that side were blocked off. The Survival Service Commission creeps along. Desperation to save the last Sumatran rhino. Whales, gorillas, elephants, and so forth. <clears throat> Stella discovered the best thing going in Ashgabat, a smiling woman selling homemade ice cream from a sidewalk kiosk. The North Koreans were thugs posing as scientists. They had recently killed South American, no, they had recently killed South Korean scientists at a conference in Prague. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. The Russians did not want to repeat. Every night, South Korean delegates were smuggled into Americans' rooms. I let the in-group know it, that I wasn't alone. Everyone was a specialist, except the North Koreans and a mumbling American dude. I asked him what he did in environmental policy. Russians picked us up for field trips and banquets and left Mr. CIA standing in the lobby. Hey, I thought our government could get a better cover. But it was all public anyway, I don't know what it was. Uh, okay. <coughs> You see wires under the table in restaurants. And this is an ad lib. Lady Scott said one night to Sir Peter in the privacy of the room, if another Russian shoves a glass of vodka in my face, I'm going to kick him in the balls. <laughs> Next day on, no Russian proffered vodka to Lady Scott. <laughs> Music blares so loud at restaurants so that people can say private things. Smoke detectors in our rooms had multiple wires. Mikhail, our own KGB agent, said, the stupidest thing I did was to come back here after my service in India. Someone offered me $300 for my Levi jacket. Dollars, not rubles. The black market runs on dollars. One evening we went to the opera. Boy meets girl by the Karakum Canal driving the collective farm tractor. <laughs> <laughs> At the Botanic Garden, I was given cuttings of the rare Afghan fig. Stella smuggled them out of Russia under her blouse. You can see them, at least one, at the Tucson Botanic Garden. Ficus Afghanistanica. Burners planned early mornings near the Iranian border. Niet, off limits, niet. Cables to Sir Peter, to Prince Philip, to the Kremlin. KGB relented. We go with you for your protection. We meet at 9 a.m. Birds are active at dawn. We leave at 5.30, niet. 9 a.m., not acceptable. No hungover Russian agent is up at 5.30. <laughs> so, go look at your birds. The 
best excursion was to Repetek Sandy Desert Reserve near the Uzbek border, a short flight to Sharzu. Due to the IUCN meeting, it became an international biosphere reserve. People stared at us. Balconies of Soviet apartments were strung with laundry. Furry two-hump camels sat sphinx-like at doorsteps. In back were rickety, multi-story outhouses. The Sandy Desert Reserve protects the northernmost cobra, the northernmost monitor lizard, and the black-tailed gazelle. We went to the dunes in multi-wheel open military trucks and were treated to juicy melons, like in every Turkmen open market. Stella and I sat in the sparse shade of a sagsal tree and savored pale melon on the other side of the world with my girlfriend. The ground quivered as a sea of long-legged ticks headed for us. <laughs> <laughs> One afternoon in Ashgabat, we were treated to horse races. Horsemen on the steps are famous but camel races were the attraction. At the second race, a wall of dark sky was moving our way. One day in five is a sandstorm. Houses have double windows to trap sand. The land was forested until horsemen torched it for grasslands that went with overgrazing as dunes spread 3,000 miles across Asia. Leaving Ashgabat, the Russians put South Koreans up front among us Americans and the North Koreans in back. <laughs> Landing in Moscow, we were whisked into U.S. embassy vans, sped across the tarmac. South Koreans went to the embassy, we went to the Rosia. Stella knew a Russian nature filmmaker, famous. <clears throat> who took us to the central broadcasting tower of the USSR. Passing increasing security, we had a showing of his films, including polar bears underwater without telephoto. During the siege of Leningrad, his parents put him between them at night. One morning, he woke shivering between his parents frozen to death. After the viewing, we were, chauffeured, we were chauffeured to an apartment block. After multiple security checks, we entered the Soviet filmmakers' club of cheerful people. Women looked like Paris. The Russian fat cats wore dry, clean Levi's with the red tag starched out. <laughs> Dinner included vodka in ice jackets and fine wine. <laughs> After dinner, our host said, now we go drink. <laughs> Everyone clapped when the Lufthansa plane left Moscow. <laughs> what time is it? How much time do we have? Time for more. Oh, yeah. <laughs> for you. Oh, OK. Well, we have two more, but we can do at least one. I renamed this Plant Power. This is part of a story from the eye of the desert. Thank you, Betsy. It happened there, it happened then. The people did less work, though sometimes it was hard, but fun because we didn't do things alone. We had time for storytelling, games and celebrations. Teenagers spent hours arranging feathers and body paint. Boys put on new face paintings all through the day. Nobody was homeless except banished criminals, and they didn't live long. Nobody was denied medicine, and doctors spent a lot of time with you. Too many babies died, and too many women didn't survive birth, childbirth. But women had special plants to prevent or end pregnancy and thought we men didn't know about it. 
People who made it through childhood and women through childbirth were lean and strong in spirit. Soul sickness was rare. Not much emphasis on living too long. Nobody knew the years. I asked some old ones if they wanted to go back to the old ways. They said, no, it was hard. We have renowned medicinal experts. Everybody collects and prepares tooth root, dock and creosote bush, desert lavender, gummy aromatic snakeweed, and dried mushroom called land's foreskin to prevent infection and cuts and wounds. Everyone knows yerba de mansa, good for so many things. Each place has over a hundred medicinal plants and more than a thousand cross the place now called the Sonoran Desert. Sometimes those shifty Nahuatl traders come up from the south and bring magic copper bells. They want drug plants, turquoise, and young women. Handsomely feathered birds are nearby, elegant trogons, and imperial woodpeckers. They taste good and they have feathers more valuable than an eagle's. In military macaws, we raise in stone cages. We trade feathers and medicinal plants for bison robes and slaves. We keep water holes open, touching the dry brush in spring, torching the dry brush in spring before the last frost. So you can count on waterfowl, turtles, cattails, and reed grass called baca for roofing, fencing, walls, mats to sleep on for baskets, arrow shafts, flutes, and containers for pigments and medicines. The people of the Red River Delta and the coastal people fashion reed boat balsas from woven bundles of baca stems, tied with mesquite root rope and waterproofed with sea lion fat. They ride out to sea to hunt sea turtles. Balsas over 30 feet long can carry 15 big sea turtles or a whole family. Sometimes they lash 30 balsas together and a hundred men row across the sea. Once I walked 40 days to Sibola because it's such a wondrous place to see. Sometimes I go with the other guys on the yearly trek to the great water for salt. It's a lot of fun, although we pretend it's a religious pilgrimage. <laughs> we come home to tell stories of swimming turtles, huge water spouting fish-like creatures, tall, dark coastal people, and creatures of the other worlds when people were animals. Do you know about the giant serpent down at the end of the desert? The little snakes grow bigger and in seven years they come out of the sea to destroy homes and crops. Once a giant snake headed for the eight holy villages. The one with intelligence came down to destroy this snake. A flash of light in the sky is said to be him, and detractors say it's just a meteorite. He turned himself into killer grasshopper. The leaders asked for help. He said, bring a leaf from each kind of plant. He put the leaves in a big pot of boiling water. When the water cooled, Killer Grasshopper jumped in and said, meet the snake and shoot arrows at it, lure it to me. He jumped up into a mesquite tree. The men met the snake, but their arrows bounced off. The giant snake got closer. Killer Grasshopper flew up and chopped off its head. The snake's head, body, and tail are a chain of black lava peaks running into the sea. Killer Grasshopper knew that desert plants have the power 
over the forces of evil. Now, if you want to hear the whole story, food plants and medicinal plants, let's get together for four nights. <laughs> okay, the last one is a story I got too, and it also came from, a, first was published in different form uh, by Ruth Giddings, uh, in, who was Emil Howery's protege or student. But all of these are just really abstracts. I have to tell you, the only work I did for this meeting was to take all these ridiculously long chapters and chop them. Okay. Invasion. Uh, this is an abridged and changed and modified version. First presented at Creative Voices and Fourth Natural History Symposium in Gila, of the Gila's in Silver City, New Mexico, in 2012. And this is the short version. And this is the last one, unless we decide we have more time. Invasion. It's 1750. Panspermia is a hot topic. Life travels between worlds or another star system. Behold the mighty water bear. Tiny tardigates, soft and plump, less than a millimeter, waddling on stubby feet, eating bacteria, plant <coughs> fluids, and smaller bears. Their own phylum, 20,000 feet in the Himalayas to the sea below 13,000 feet, tropics to polar. Little bears curl up and survive, freezing, boiling, desiccation, radiation, and the vacuum of space. And these are multi or multi-organ creatures. They like mosses especially aquatic mosses. I walk up Railroad Canyon in the Black Range before summer rains. An archipelago of drying pools. One is water brimmed. Green aquatic mosses shimmer in morning sun. I look for families of all female water bears. Less water in the next pool until the last one is dry. Water striders and squadrons of water bears skip to the nearest water pool. Like the archipelago of Gulf of California desert islands, from largest of highest life diversity to smaller, more arid ones, to a tiny bird shit island with only one plant species. It's 12,500 years ago. It's time to move on. This place, this place stinks from our refuse. Stinks for more than that, too. No more giant tortoises. And the big animals are onto our ways and run away. It was easier in the old days, though not much fun, hunting animals so stupid you can walk right up and kill them. We move beyond misty mountains, moving on for easier meat and getting away from old women telling us what to do. It's a thousand years ago. We come to vacant land, foolish farmers overpopulated, cut down trees until the rivers ran brown and then dry. <coughs> Dark mud rooms piled on top of each other, dark, dank rooms, piled on top of each other like amplexing toads. We're smarter. We're hunters. We aren't buried in possessions like stink on shit, easy to make, hard to get rid of. We know when to move. Our women know how to prevent unwanted brats. But when you're too old to keep up, we leave you in the desert, 
with some water and a dog. 1540, <coughs> stories circulated even before the invasive foreigners arrived on their northward trespass. Strangers as, as stride, big deer-like tame animals. We thought the intruders might be a different species. Ones in brown fussed over imitations with the four cardinal directions. But they were actually human, albeit with sick skin, too much hair, and their stink incredible. <laughs> they were hungry even when food was all around. The ridicule ceased when we learned how efficiently they killed their war dogs and their deadly diseases. Amazing stories came from the people of the mouth of the Red River, where intruders arrived in strange boats, like live things, in strange boats, like live things, because they saw their wings move. Those intruders were different. They brought gifts. Later encounters down the Gulf were the usual roaring and killing like lightning. Island warriors tied sea turtle bladders to their waist cords and popped their turtle bladders, but the noise wasn't loud enough to kill the intruders. 1812, the Gila runs cottonwoods and willow galleries to the Red River, spreading into the immense delta. Our rivers run bouquets of fish, like the Colorado 100-pound, six-foot pike minnow. We walk in speckle-shaded, smooth, damp trails, places of no spines, beavers, otters, ducks, herons, cranes, egrets, turtles, and frogs. The people are everywhere, except on the big mountain. The giant snake lives up there, crossing canyons without going to the bottom. Hunters hear it moving at night. 1845, we want settlers and miners to go away. Their diseases kill more than half the people. Children and elders go first. <coughs> After close encounters, we fumigate homes and clothing with oily smoke from all thorn wood. We fight for our land. They call us savages. And this is from bio, Biomass Balance again. Hopi prophecies say the end will come when they put a house in the sky. <clears throat> Weaponry and war escalate lockstep with population. Gaia demands balance. Population balances all the animals gone. Atomics balance the future. Curiosity rover eats Mars dirt, finds odd bright stuff. Engineers don't have time to sterilize the contraption. Probably not much chance to contaminate. Probably. It's 2032. Ghoul Apple brings in precious metal from their asteroid. Stockholders want returns. Cut costs. Cut sterilization. It's 2042. A strange microbe rode in on a ghoul apple space train. Ate our chlorophyll. Water bears endure. Cheerful. <laughs> okay, so what are we standing about?
just taking an hour and get it. <laughs> I'll try to go through it fast. It's not too long. It'll only take an hour. <laughs> no. By the way, all of these are just parts. But maybe a short is better. The sapling grows up. Walking to school in early mornings, early small years, our straight trees were sycamores, the London Plain, although our street is named Las Palmas. <laughs> I preferred California sycamore, although it grows crooked. I imagine, this is walking to school, I imagine the people gone, as they will someday, trees growing through houses falling apart. Olive trees from the Mediterranean might keep going for centuries. Our neighbor, a renowned allergist, had a whole grove of olive trees providing the neighborhood with olive pollen hay fever. <laughs> <laughs> we kids gave fresh, juicy olives to any new kid from back east. <laughs> okay, I don't have to tell you anymore. <laughs> Plants and animals could move in from open spaces like La Brea tar pits but a mile away, still sort of natural. The tar pits were our hunting grounds. Most of them were not fenced. At spring rains, we found tree frogs breeding in water on top of tar pools, and two striped garter snakes lurking for fat frogs. Years later, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and the Page Museum of Tar Pit Fossils and their parking lots covered our hunting grounds. Not far from school was a stream with native sycamores, California live oaks, and big California newts. Tarica torosa. Unlike most salamanders, they have dry skin. They have big, bright eyes, a happy smile, and rise up inquisitive. Give one a wet, wiggling earthworm and watch it get stuffed down with yellow bottom splayed out hands. In junior high, the stream was buried in a concrete coffin. My first experience of rage against my world. I often made it through school evolving creatures and plants, one to another. Another was to sit in the back of the room and have one of my books inside a textbook. Sometimes I brought back extirpated mountain lions and condors and resurrected Ice Age tar pit creatures like giant ground sloths, dire wolves, mammoths, and muscular saber-toothed tigers. What would it be like to see the sabers of a saber-toothed tiger in action? Maybe they use them to rig rotting flesh off Ice Age mammals mired in the tar. What's wrong with an heroic animal being a scavenger? America's national symbol is a carrion eater, and so is Mexico's. <laughs> I read every book on natural history I could get my hands on, Raymond Dittmar's reptile books, and the three volume small print thin paper Cyclopedia of Horticulture. By Liberty Hyde Bailey, that I pestered my father to buy for me. The bookstore salesman told Dad it was not a book for children. <laughs> for the first time, I confronted adult authority in anger and dominance. I was 10 years old and got my encyclopedia. I still use it. Liberty Hyde Bailey was still collecting palm specimens in the Amazon in his late 90s. I got Ricketts and Steinbeck's Sea of Cortez. I threw the Steinbeck part away. <laughs> Ricketts' vivid descriptions and photos of marine life set me on a course of discovery to the Gulf of California. 
Later in life, I met another of my heroes, Archie Carr, yeah. the Windward Row. He called me Chico. I sort of realized there was a way to avoid remembering names. <laughs> a major turning point was my high school biology teacher, Nancy Thomas Neely. At lunchtime, I hung out with natural history friends in Nancy's wood bungalow classroom that had been moved on to the school campus. Scientific names only. A sanctuary from the sports-inflicted outer world. Nancy brought us scientific journal articles from her boyfriend, Peter ne Neely, working on his PhD at UCLA. After class, Nancy often took us to Palos Verde tidal pools or to Joshua Tree National Monument wasn't a national monument there. And every new creature identified. Through Peter, I came in contact with UCLA professor Raymond Coles. I went to seminars and tagged along on field trips. One Christmas vacation, Nancy and Peter invited me to go to Alamos in southern Sonora, the edge of the tropics. Bromeliads, cycads, palms, orchids, towering cactus, long-nosed green vine snakes, boa constrictors, cichlid fish, and tropical trees. Such splendors made California fire climax, sclerophorous scrub seem deprived. <laughs> there were UCLA and natural history people in three vehicles. There were Autobahn birders in a car that looked like an upside down bathtub and was about as fast. The birders did not believe in birth control. I argued we will have population control or death control, etc., etc. They said we need to make more room at the table. We went round and round. They lamented the laws of nature and claimed to be pacifists. Did you think that one up or did you get it from the biologically challenged Pope? <laughs> Everybody got tired of my arguing, although they, they agreed with me. I was 15 and sure of myself. I decided on the University of Arizona since it was as close as I could get to the tropics. <laughs> Undergraduate work and graduate work, University of Arizona in Tucson, and as often as possible field work in Arizona and Sonora and islands in the Gulf of California. I ended up spending most of my life in Tucson, home base in the Sonoran Desert. When I was a kid, I vowed to live where there's no frost, Jean. <laughs> if you're growing interesting plants, frost-free is important. <laughs> After graduate school, I decided on Perth in Western Australia. Vietnam was raging. I had my Australian papers ready when a job offer came through at the University of Colorado at Boulder. The FBI was spying on my friends, and perhaps me too. Australia seemed a good idea. Then I was offered a sweet job as senior curator in charge of botany at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. I was thickly involved publicizing population and environment. One day the museum director called me to a hands-folded meeting, the topic, the topic being population control, reminding me that my salary comes from the public sector. Good. All the more reason to alert the public about population and <laughs> What else should a researcher at the Natural History Museum be doing? Once I was invited to a meeting of wealthy supporters of population control, an overfed gentle, gentleman, an overfed 
gentleman ranted about an overpopulated future. He waved a frozen soy burger and threatened we would all have to be vegetarians. I felt like saying, do I get fresh mushrooms on it? <laughs> Joe Pine, a smash mouth specializing in making fools of publicity seekers, had a national TV show. He wanted me on after the Los Angeles Times headlined an interview with me, quoting out of context, if we didn't if we don't do something about population, civilization will collapse in 50 or so years. Joe kept pestering me. I mentioned it to Paul Ehrlich, and he had the hots to be on Joe's show. I told Joe to get Paul instead of me. I relented if both of us would be on. I needn't have been concerned. Paul, Paul hogged the whole time. <laughs> He was as big an egomaniac, egomaniac as Joe. The difference is Joe Pine is forgotten, and Paul Ehrlich is not. Paul's book, The Population Bomb, had exploded across the planet, and I thought it was perhaps the most important book to be published in our times. The left vilified him as an elitist pig. The right vilified him as anti-business. Academics vilified him for non-scientific writing. Later detractors smirked. His predictions have not happened, or have they? The Los Angeles County Museum of Natural History was a wondrous old place. One of the guards ran, one of the guards ran a drug and prostitution business out the back door <laughs> and asked if there was anything I wanted. <laughs> no charge because I was the only curator who talked to him. <laughs> I drove an hour each way on the freeway to be out of the smog and hear the sound of waves. Curator's office, offices and collections were on the third floor off limits to the public. One day I stayed late it was before remote alarms and such. Guards would not work except with big dogs. If you stayed late, you had a call to the back door on the hour before leaving. Walking to my car, two guys came up fast. I got to my car just in time. Next day I left a letter of resignation. <laughs> Drove back to Arizona. The only thing I really know is to keep on botanizing and writings. And so notes for next time, if we're so smart, why do we still have war? Why are millions of people suffering unspeakable abuses? Why are animals and plants disappearing? Why is your government stockpiling nukes to wipe us off the planet? And what about an addictive male starlet pill? Addictive male birth control starlet pill? in the hands of women. <laughs> Is there an adaptive value for consciousness? Anyway, thank you all. <laughs>